And a big welcome to everyone. I would like to uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians, the elders past, present and emerging. I'm speaking to you from Bonda National Park, which is on Dirindganj country in uh, the Ewan Nation on the far south coast of New South Wales. And I extend those acknowledgements to any Aboriginal persons present. We've got a fantastic um, meeting today. Um, we've got a wonderful um, range of presenters, but the first two people I want to um, just quickly um, introduce are Luke Hamilton and Minka Waratah. And Luke is Minka's dad. And with Tathra Wharf, the interest that um, Minka showed as a student diving underneath the Tathra Wharf and capturing amazing videos of the uh, biodiversity there and with Luke um, really driving some uh, local community action to really focus on how to protect that biodiversity when uh, we have a big restoration project. And look, I'm just looking at the people that have come into the room and I know that we've got David um, Buckley, who's the project contractor manager um, with the Bega Valley Shire Council for that major project, um, which is a really important one because the Tarpa Wharf is um, valued by a huge number of people, um, you know, throughout this region and elsewhere. And so thank you for being here, David. And we've also got Libby Hepburn in the room. Libby uh, is the, um, I don't know, Supremo CEO of the Atlas of Life in the Coastal Wilderness. And uh, the Atlas has been uh, playing for over a decade now, a key role in capturing um, biodiversity information and mapping that, and also supporting young people like Minka and other people who are um, you know, involved in trying to conserve and protect and, and really value and treasure the amazing living things on our coast. So um, with that, I'm going to hand over to Luke and Minka, and um, Luke's going to give us a quick little update on the project that's happening here, and um, he'll be introducing the uh, speakers that we've got as well. Thank you, Luke. So Minka's going to give the introductions to all the speakers. Um, I'm just going to give a quick update of the Tartar Wharf and, and the situation um, we're in here now, and the reason we're all here um to learn more about how to um, do the repairs so um Tathra wharf's um being restored and as part of the wharf restoration project um council intend to replace uh 44 percent or 44 of the in-water pylons with new turpentine or other hardwood pylons and clad these with hdpe sleeves or denso wrap to one meter above the high water mark so that's the reason why we need to um, be able to uh, recolonize the pylons. Um, they plan to clear and remove the encrusted marine organisms from the remaining 26 piles um, and clad those with HDPE as well and remove all diagonal support pylons and substitute them with the addition of eight steel lateral support beams. Um, Council contracted NGH Environmental uh, who, who then had Elgin Associates conduct an extensive marine ecology assessment which identified uh, threatened and protected species, um, being the big bellied seahorse. Hopefully, you've all spotted one there in the slideshow, and a number of piles with high significant ecological value. On review of the report, Council made numerous amendments to its original proposal um, to favour successful marine growth and to increase accessibility for divers and other user groups. Um, the Tathraw Structure Restoration Tender has been awarded to GPM Marine Constructions and the work is likely to commence um, dependent on the supply of sufficient piles and structural timbers um, around September. Um, and the works are going to be undertaken in stages, which will ensure access to the cafe and museum and other parts of the wharf uh, for fishermen and tourists. Um, Water access for divers and swimmers will be maintained via a scaffolding platform and that ensures our restoration activities can also continue. So the overall duration of the works is estimated to be 12 months and a fisheries permit uh, has been included uh, with the conditions um, for the mitigation measures identified in the marine ecology report. 
um, some important considerations of the permit issued under part seven of the Fisheries Management Act 1994 by the DPI at Fisheries giving approval for the project to go ahead state that four of the redundant piles are now to be retained unwrapped um, in situ in place which is great so they can help recolonize um, some of the new wrapped pylons um, nine big bellied seahorse are to be relocated prior to the works commencing and that was under a separate permit um, a secondary wrapping of rock mesh is to be applied to all new and wrapped piles to promote the recolonization of aquatic organisms um, and it's expected that this measure would assist macro algae to recolonize those new um, HDPE surfaces as well. The concrete boots that are currently um, at the base of a few of the piles are to be um, retained as well rather than removed, which is great because they're um, home to lots of macro algae and uh, one of the areas where the seahorse love to hang out and up to 10 piles with high aquatic biodiversity values are to be reattached to the wharf structure and remain in a vertical position in the same row on the wharf structure until the recolonization of marine organisms is established on the new or clean piles. So they're all great um, conditions from fisheries. So DPI Fisheries uh, also encourages council to continue to support the activities of the Tathra Wharf Group, which is us, in surveying and assisting the recolonization of aquatic life on the pylons following the completion of the work, which is great. Um, and saying that, we would like to acknowledge the excellent work of um, the Bega Valley Shire Council Wharf Restoration Project Manager and Engineer David Buckley for his willingness to work constructively with our group. Thank you, David. And to assist our efforts working towards the best possible outcomes. Um, so the reason we're all here tonight is to learn the best and most effective ways for us as concerned divers, ocean lovers and as citizen scientists to aid and to assist the effective and hopefully speedy recovery of the beautiful and diverse organisms that you've seen in the pictures um, that call man-made structures around the world their home. Um, so I'd like to say thank you to all the speakers who are joining us tonight um, to share their who are going to share their experiences doing just that in their own backyards. So I'll hand over to Minka to introduce um, our first speaker. Uh, thank you, Dad. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Minka Waratah. Our first speaker today is Sophie Teed. I'll just give a quick introduction, then we'll jump into your talk. So Sophie Teed, as the Environmental Manager for Bustleton Jetty, Sophie oversees all aspects of environmental management, assessments, and sustainability within the organization. Being a marine scientist with her extensive knowledge of the local marine environment, she also conducts environmental monitoring programs, marine debris removal, and, the, and is the creator of a unique method for rehabilitating soft corals and sea sponges on the jetty's piles. That's the Bustleton Jetty in WA. As an avid scuba diver, Sophie likes nothing more than the opportunity to dive exploring beneath Bustleton Jetty and the extensive seagrass meadows nearby. Sophie has a strong interest in educational and community engagement, as we can see by her being here today. Uh, she sits on the Southwest Australia Marine Parks Advisory Committee to advise on Commonwealth Marine Park Management, is a manager of the Australian Marine Science Association, the Malacological Society of Australasia and has previously volunteered with the Western Australian Museum Laboratories and State Department of Fisheries. Sophie is also the recipient of the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization's Annual Marine Studies Award for her work in the jetty pile rehabilitation. Uh, thank you very much, Sophie. Uh, take it away. Thank you for the um, lovely introduction and um, it's a pleasure to be um, sharing my perspectives um, on Jetty Marine Life here today. I'm just going to, what's going on there? Go into the slideshow. My face will disappear. So um, I'm speaking to you today from Bustleton in, over in Western Australia. Um, a little bit quickly about our jetty. Um, we have a, a 1.8 kilometre long um, tourist jetty 
and beneath the structure um, we have a mix of um, mixed hardwood timber piles um, including turpentine as well as jarra and nari our local hardwoods <clears throat> and newer parts of the construction are also um, made of steel and my presentation today is um, really um, going through um, my rehabilitation work and um, as Minka mentioned, um, I was awarded a UNESCO, um, I, it's the Intergovernmental um, Commission Award for student research for my work um, in rehabilitating soft coral and sponge communities. And I first began this work in, um, in 2017, which five years ago, and we've been able to replicate it um, and extend this um, rehabilitation program out. Um, to cover areas of the jetty that um, not only where the piles are treated um, for wrapping to prevent the progression of burrito worms, um, but also um, for newer piles. So we've got a long jetty, there's always new piles going in. Um, and now that rehabilitation program forms part um, of my everyday role. So we have quite a strong environmental management plan at the site. Um, we have uh, marine species um, counts and abundance. Um, we collect daily water temperatures um, and all of these um, data collection programs link in with other, other government programs um, or university researchers um, to feed into marine park management. Um, collecting marine debris, um, as Minka mentioned, but we also manage our uh, tour, operation, um, tour operations to ensure that we're not having a negative impact um, on the site and we're leaving it in better condition than before. So this is what a little Torito worm looks like. Um, this is one that I um, actually sucked out of a, a timber pile um, <clears throat> and we got it um, preserved in resin. So the Torito worms are actually a clam. Um, so the head is like a little drill and these um, little bivalve mollusks burrow into the timber um, over time. And um, over time, those little burrows uh, reduce the structural integrity of the, the main structure. Um, and the, the wrapping system is uh, multi-layered with a bio side to kill anything that's burrowed into the, um, into the jetty piles. And then um, a layer of different types of plastics are put over the top. And that's called the, the MG60 wrap system. Um, we don't, we're not using Denso wrap um, over here anymore. Uh, oh, there we go. Um, so we've got a couple of videos. Um, I wonder if I'm just going to click forward. Hopefully that is going on. So when the wrapping happened, um, I don't know if this is going to work. When the wrapping initially happened, um, it happened in the sanctuary zone at the end of Basselton Jetty. And this is typical of the, the life that we have out there. Um, lots of schools of fish, lots of um, um, demersal fish, um, as well as uh, your reef associated fish like bullseyes um, and fusiliers going into um, where the area where the piles were wrapped. As soon as the invertebrate colonies were removed from the piles, um, all of the fish life also disappeared. And so we were faced with quite a short window to um, come up with our remediation plan. Um, <laughs> this was filmed by some local scuba divers. Um, and so all of the uh, colonies were just left to die. So this is probably a way of how not to do things. Um, how we work with the commercial divers and our local council now is very much a managed plan of attack where we identify individual piles um, that are required to be wrapped. We ensure that um, no more than um, half of a pile row, so that's either two or um, three piles are wrapped in any single row. And we also reduce um, every second row. So we, 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 we can't afford to have, um, you can see in the background, <clears throat> an unwrapped pile 
And that's quite key for the recolonization because a lot of these sponges and corals um, don't have a yolk when they are in their plankton stage. So they're only going to survive as a plankton um, or a propagule for 24 to 48 hours. So that time they can only um, swim a short distance before they get to um, their next substrate. That was quite an important um, learning for us. So what we wanted, um, what I really wanted to answer is, um, can the fragments of sponges or soft corals that are removed from this main substrate um, be able to recolonize? How does the plastic wrap affect any new larval success, um, larval settlement and then succession of that community? And then if there was other um, biotic or abiotic factors. So here's our um, really long jetty over in Geograph Bay in Western Australia. Um, so I basically collected up um, lots of little fragments and you can see them collected in my hand, really small. So the largest ones um, were about five to 10 centimetres of the soft coral. Many of the sponges were um, only about the size of a 50 cent coin. Um, I used <clears throat> multiple types of mesh, <clears throat> but this plastic garden lattice actually worked yeah. out to be the best. Um, it held kind of as a basket those fragments against the substrate without forcing them onto it, which um, gave those um, sponges or the corals um, lots of water flow and then they were able to reattach by themselves um, and I photo monitored those. So just in the 12 months um, of the first experiment, we, I was quite really able to show um, that the rehabilitated areas in um, just 12 months were definitely um, supporting the recolonization. And that our soft coral, um, which is the snowflake or carajoa coral, is the dominant um, organism in our marine community. I also uh, was able to show that opportunistic thing. So um, it's the blue ascidian, Clavulina molicensis. That's quite an opportunistic um, uh, settler and it will mainly settle um, quite prolifically during the early years. So during the, after the period of um, doing the rehabilitation, that was quite a dominant animal. Um, and then as the coral begins to take hold and regrow, um, its dominant drop down. For a reasonably um, simple method, but taking um, the consideration of the individual species um, biological characteristics, you can see the image on the right. This is just in 12 months. Um, so um, we've got about 85% um, um, coverage um, of regrowth and we were able to support quite a, a large variety of diversity in those communities. By having multiple species um, randomly spread out, um, it turned out that there was um, just four key species. So it was a bit of trial and error um, in terms of um, which species were able to um, successfully reattach, but the presence of four um, types of sponges and the soft coral really did kickstart that overall diversity um, coming in. Um, and today that mimics um, what we have as a natural looking pile. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Sophie. That was really, really interesting. It's uh, great to see insight into how you've done it and gives us hope for the Tartha Wharf project as well. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. Our next speaker is Nathan Cook. Uh, Nathan is a marine scientist and reef restoration expert who has worked in Australia and internationally implementing restoration projects in a variety of scenarios. He's a scuba diving instructor with over 4,000 dives and 20 years experience working in the Pacific and Southeast Asia. Nathan is currently studying a PhD in coral reef restoration at James Cook University. Uh, Nathan will be sharing insights into methods and techniques used in coral restoration across a variety of environments. He will briefly discuss lessons 
learned from implementing multiple mm. in situ reef restoration projects throughout Queensland, including the Gold Coast and Great Barrier Reef. Uh, we're so thankful to have you join us today, Nathan. Thank you very much and uh, take it away. Thanks for that, Minka. Hopefully you can see a screen share. Uh, yep, that's all clear. Awesome. So my name is Nathan Cook. Uh, I'd just like to um, hopefully get this moving. I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land where I'm presenting from today, the Woolgaroo Kabar and Bindal people from Townsville in far north Queensland. As Minka mentioned, I uh, have a bit of background. I used to live on this island in, in, in the Gulf of Thailand called Koh Tao. Um, you know, used to bring a lot of colour to the job that I did, restoring reefs, mostly coral reefs, and pretty much learnt the techniques of restoration by doing. So I didn't have any um, theoretical study. It was more of a try it and see. And so this presentation is going to be a lot about things that I've done and a lot of the things that I wouldn't recommend doing for this particular project at the Tathra Wharf and basically all the things that went wrong. We used to use a lot of artificial reef structures in Thailand like these ones that you can see in the pictures here, mostly because the reefs where we dived and took um, tourists was heavily overexploited. And so we used to create artificial reefs and turn them into biotic structures through a process of coral gardening, mostly not mostly, exclusively of hard corals that were dominant in that site. Um, you can see we did things like build shipwrecks, like this image in the middle here, and then colonise it with corals from our nursery. And that's what it looked like a few years later on the right hand side. Other structures like these um, square cement structures and reef balls on the bottom right as well. But I want to talk a little bit about what we've been doing on the Gold Coast and it's going to be a bit more relevant to what's happening at Tathra and what Sophie was talking about in Bustleton. After speaking to Sophie, I realised my methods could have been better if I'd used um, what she'd done and actually laid the mesh over the top rather than underneath the corals, but I'll get to that. So recently on the Gold Coast, they've implemented an artificial reef um, dive site called Wonder Reef, and it's made up of these seven flutes. The image in the middle there, visibility is not great, so apologies for the image, but they've got nine of these flutes floating mid-water. The bottom of that flute is around 17 metres deep, top around 10 metres, and the bottom at that location is 30 metres deep. So it's pretty unique. Lots of vertical um, sides and uh, um, of the structures to try and transplant organisms on. And they invited us in to try and transplant corals to improve the biodiversity of this location. So we sourced uh, predominantly hard corals, but also some soft corals at nearby reefs in Palm Beach. Originally, we asked them to drill a whole bunch of holes into the structure so that I had some attachment points to which I could bolt some plates or maybe tie some ropes onto the structure. But in the three months between the structures going in the water and then us getting there, they were covered in a thick layer of barnacles. So we couldn't actually get access, find any of the holes. So they drilled about 320 of them and we couldn't find any. So we had to improvise. So we used uh, this tensor mesh and we tried a combination of different things, um, both hard corals and soft corals. Soft corals didn't work using this method, mostly because I've used cable ties, as you can see in that structure, uh, sorry, in the image. And I probably would have been better off to sandwich them within two sheets of that mesh rather than have them on top. Or alternatively, I could have had them on the underside rather than the outside of the structure. But the problem was we actually had them overlaying the barnacles. So I could have scraped off the barnacles and then put that on um, the coral side down and it might have had more effective um, methods but we also had trouble getting a really tight attachment with those corals so but what Sophie's done in Bustleton for wharf pilings sounds like a really good idea another thing you could try is using rope 
we've tried using biodegradable rope. But as you can see in this image on the left and right for our nursery corals, the biodegradable rope did exactly what it's designed to do and it biodegraded too quickly for our purposes. So we had to go back to regular polypropylene rope. We did try a couple of different types of um, uh, what do you call it? Biodegradable rope, but both of them had the same lifespan. If they lasted about 18 months or so, that would have worked for us because it would have just, they had time for the corals to grow out onto honest. the reefs. And then the corals would have um, done like these ones. So these are some of our rope nurseries. Having been out planted onto the reef, you can see the rope is indicated by the, the yellow arrows. And the whole purpose is that we've nailed those ropes to the reef using concrete nails, but you could wrap them tightly around a wharf piling or a jetty you know, piling. The aim is that these corals, if they're firm enough, and if you were using sponges or soft corals, the same theory would apply. As long as they were tight enough to the, their surface that they want to attach to, they should make their own attachment. So you can see after about six months, this coral here, has actually made its own attachment. So over time, once we can see that this is secure, we can actually go and trim off these excess bits of rope and the coral will be stable and secure to its new location, which is the ultimate aim of any of these restorative processes. It's getting those benthic communities to be self-attached and comfortable, regular, um, members of that coral community. On the Gold Coast project, not very clear pictures, but you can see here, these are corals about six months later and um, after we've planted them. And so the picture on the right with the white arrow is one of the corals we used underwater putty to attach it to the reef. Sally's Need It Aqua is the name of the product that you can get from the hardware store. And I reckon if you use that in combination with other things, so you had a rope tying it around a wharf piling and then the putty to give it a bit more security, you'll, you'd probably get really good results, result, results quickly. On the left here, you can't see the rope very clearly, but what we've got is a rope that's tied through this hole. And it's tied tightly enough that this coral colony is actually growing um, self-attached to the structure, even despite all the competition from turf algae, uh, barnacles and other things that are growing on it. So because it was nice and secure, it was able to self-attach um, in the six months that we've been out there. A couple of other images, again, um, these are ones using putty. I think I've just repeated those. This one on the bottom in the middle here, you can see the tassels of the rope have actually frayed and they were causing quite a problem for the coral because they were quite abrasive. Um, and we couldn't seal the ends of the rope before we went underwater because we didn't know how long the rope needed to be. So we could only cut them with scissors underwater. But if you know how long your rope needs to be, which you could determine from the width of the pilings, um, then you, would, you could avoid that by burning the ends of the rope and stopping that fraying happen. And this other picture you can see here on the right-hand side, you can see also on the rope there, this coral colony hasn't self-attached yet to this struct, the, the, the base here, because it's not secure enough, but the, um, you can see the healthy coral is growing pretty well over the rope that it's attached to and should. It's probably because it doesn't have enough downward force so in that picture, I would suggest if you had that and maybe augmented it with some adhesive, you might get some better results. So, and there you can see in that final picture how we've used the rope to tie to that structure um, at one reef. So we actually cleared off the overgrowing um, barnacle community to get a bit of clear air for those corals to grow on. But, um, and some of it's worked and especially like this guy up the top here, who's pretty tight on that edge. Um, that's probably not dissimilar to the one that I showed you in the previous slide that's on the left there, that's um, made its own self-attachment. So I'll leave it at that. This is just a brief snapshot of some of the things we've learned. And um, hopefully those of you doing the, um, the 
restoration work in Tathra, got some ideas there for things um, that you could do and things probably not to do. Uh, thank you so much, Nathan. That was, yeah, really, really interesting and heaps of good insights there. Um, cool, thank you. Uh, our next speaker is AJ Morton. AJ is a master diver and specialty dive instructor, trainer and assessor, cave diver and marine conservation educator. AJ owns and operates Melbourne-based adventure scuba diving business, dive to you Mobile Adventures. AJ and his crew conducted the highly successful sponge relocation project called Operation Sponge at the Blagari Yacht Squadron uh, at the Blagari Pier on the Mornington Peninsula. Thank you very much for joining us today, AJ. Hello, thanks for having me. Um, I can't see everyone's faces out there, but I'm sure you're all out in digital land and I, uh, I thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, I don't have the amazing marine scientists and um, that kind of experience. Our project was a little bit different. Uh, we literally, uh, as general divers and, and community members, uh, basically banded together to try and save one of our uh, favourite dive sites. If you've not heard of Blairgarry Pier before, it's probably Melbourne's number one dive site, I'd have to say. Uh, and the particular features there is the, uh, the marina has a vertical wave attenuation wall. So it has a wall that's suspended underwater to stop any of the surge and wave energy coming through and pushing all the fancy boats around. Um, so on that wall, uh, we have an amazing uh, sponge and acidian and soft coral garden there, um, of which we're all very fond of. Uh, and we can see amazing creatures like nudibranchs and seahorses, uh, tasseled anglerfish and cuttlefish and octopus and, and so on. Um, so much so that it's also a favourite spot for the spider crab migration to come through uh, and basically use it as a smorgasbord uh, on their way through. So uh, some of the footage you would have seen through the Blue Planet series uh, uh, was filmed down at, at Blair Gowrie. Um, what I'll do is I'll share with you um, a prezo that we created back in the day just to kind of summarise our project to give you some statistics about uh, what worked and what didn't uh, or how successful it was. Um, so we'll just kick that on. We'll pay our respects uh, as we need to elders both past, present and emerging. Our crew down here are the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. So we, uh, we pay our respects uh, as always. Um, how did the uh, Operation Sponge come about? It was originally nicknamed Sponge Bob, but we apparently can get into trouble for that. Uh, so we used Operation Sponge instead. Basically, we were uh, hosting a bit of a film crew down at Blair Gary Pier who were doing some filming for the spider crab migration. I had a bit of a chat with the crew up on the pier who managed the marina and whatnot and told us about that wave attenuation wall getting uh, removed. Uh, which is about 150 metres uh, linear habitat and about two and a half to three metres of suspension running along there. So a lot of surface area uh, was about to get scrapped. Um, it had been there growing for at least 11 years so far. And to give you an idea, that image there, that's how, um, I guess, abundant it was and healthy. Um, the plan was literally uh, for the construction crew to pull all those panels out and throw them in the bin. There was no plan of any kind of restoration or saving anything whatsoever. So this would have been back in mid-2016. So I wish I had known about things like Sophie's projects and Nathan's projects because that information would have been critical. Um, uh, but we just uh, went at it. Uh, so we had to come up with a plan very quickly because we basically had about a week before they had to start pulling the panels out. Um, about five o'clock in the morning, uh, we had a very smart idea of saying, okay, well, how are we going to reattach the new panels? And we came up with the idea of using um, aquarium-based glue, the cryo glue. Um, basically, we had no other... I guess, technology uh, or let alone funding available for us to come up with anything that fancy uh, other than just literally scraped it off uh, the old timbers and glue it on the new timbers uh, and hopefully 
it all works. So basically we came up with a plan, punched it through to the commercial diving crew and the Blair Gary Yacht Squadron to get some uh, approval there. Uh, as you can see there, the whole project was born in four days. Uh, so then the next plan was basically to go drum up some, uh, some exposure. So everyone started to volunteer. And this is an example of um, uh, the little promo video we, uh, we managed to kind of get put together to help us drum up some, uh, uh, some volunteers basically. So we have to have audios coming through. Uh, we don't have any audio at the moment. Okay. Um, just if you go back, did you tick that little box, um, AJ? If you go back and stop sharing. Let me see. And then just go back in and there's a little tick box um, in that sharing window. So. You're all over it, buddy. I love it. <laughs> and so that'll collapse something. <laughs> okay. Here we go. We just started racking our brains about what we could do. The habitat that's growing on those timbers, uh, it's going in the bin. We have 150 linear metres of wall here. It came to us that perhaps we could cut the old sponge off the old wall section and paste it to the new wall section. We're intervening to try and relocate most of that habitat. So a big job. It'd be such a shame to, to see it go anywhere else, but you know, back in the water. I'd hope that people get excited about the project, uh, get excited about looking after habitat in general and uh, ultimately get some divers ready uh, and, and sign up and volunteer and help us uh, relocate these five and a half thousand sponges. Create a template for temperate waters. Well, there you go. <laughs> So enough to create a bit of emotion around the, uh, the project to try and, uh, and get some help. So how did we do it? We did trial um, or come up with different ways of trying to basically hold the new sponge life to the new panel. So we knew if we could hold it there long enough, eventually it would attach. Uh, our community here is very anti-plastic and things like that. So we couldn't use plastic mesh and things like that. So we tried to use geofab. We've tried to use other uh, natural fiber meshes and things like that, but we just couldn't uh, get it to stay, let alone um, as the wave energy and the surge and the tide runs through there, it would just loosen it off and we'd lose uh, everything. So we literally had to uh, invent it uh, as we go. Pretty much having to work side by side with the commercial divers because we were in the water together. So as they were replacing new panels, we were up the other end removing marine life from old panels and transferring it down. So we had to come up with ways of how do we remove it safely? How do we then transport it to the new section? And then obviously how do we uh, attach it? So there was a massive education curve for everyone, including all the, the training uh, and the OHS about our volunteers and, and then uh, the ongoing monitoring. Challenges, very interesting. That is Frankston, that picture. <laughs> we could get some pretty wild weather here. Um, I think the coldest water temperature was eight degrees. So um, a lot of environmental uh, considerations there. So creating our in-water process, the type of adhesives. So we had to go through uh, a bit of a, uh, a trial and error here around that glue and also try and uh, identify ones that had, um, I guess, the least amount of uh, toxicity to sponges and the like, because they all work for corals and, uh, and all the more hardy stuff. But when we start gluing sponges and ascidians, um, 
uh, tenant elements, I believe, was the one that was creating uh, some potential um, harm uh, to it. So we had to try and find and source our own glue with that. Um, and yes, funding, who's going to pay for it all? So we managed to, uh, to, to drum up a bunch of funding to have this, uh, have this sorted. Weather, boats, fishes, um, spicules, they're the little spikes that are inside sponges. So if you handle them too hardly, uh, you'll end up getting uh, a bunch of spicules uh, and potentially having some uh, allergic reactions and, uh, and all sorts of things happening there. There's our bro, as you can see in the picture. We have the blue ring octopus down here. So as we're handling sponges, there's all sorts of things uh, we have to be careful of. Um, exposure times in the water, like I said, temperatures got down to eight degrees. So how long could we actually keep divers in the water? Uh, and how many dives a day could we realistically expect? Um, and then handling the adhesive itself. So um, harm and contact to us, uh, as well as uh, the marine life. Um, lots of things to, uh, to develop here. I'll show you some pictures of the equipment there, but there's um, someone in the water uh, attaching the bungee ropes. I'll explain how uh, that came about in a, in a, in a minute. Um, and then obviously an example there of how uh, the adhesive is working. So uh, the adhesive, we ended up getting some help from a chemical engineer out in uh, Dandenong, which is not far from where we are, um, and they import adhesives uh, uh, and the like. So we came to them with the glue that we sourced from local aquarium distributors and said, hey, uh, what's in this and can we get it uh, in bulk because we're going to need a lot. Uh, and they managed to help source it directly from, uh, uh, from China, a hell of a lot cheaper for us, uh, and we were able to uh, order in different viscosities. Um, we then decanted that adhesive into uh, silicon cartridges in their factory uh, so that we can then literally just dive underwater with silicon guns uh, and have uh, enough glue on mass to maximize our time in the water while we were gluing, uh, uh, gluing the sponges. Uh, an amazing experience, I'll tell you what. Um, so there's an example of the divers there using uh, scrapers. Uh, we were able to scrape the sponges off, the adult sponges uh, and the like uh, in, you know, in adult form in large clumps and whatnot and relocate it. The top right picture there, that's our Spongeomatic 2000. Um, that's how we transferred the sponges from, uh, you know, from where the uh, old panels were over to the new panels, keeping the sponges and whatnot in the water because uh, they don't do well with, when you pull them out. So we used two massive bread crates, uh, zip tied it together, created some uh, flexible doors so that the, uh, the divers, uh, we had a scraping team, a collection team, we had a transport team and we had a gluing team. Uh, so they all worked very well together. Bottom left, you can see the, uh, the bungee setups. So uh, like I said, we couldn't use mesh and things like that. So we decided to run a bungee setup and those bungees uh, would stay on for two weeks. Uh, so after a little bit of trial and error, we realized that the, it took about 10 to 14 days for the sponges to, uh, to self-adhere to the timber. So if we kept the, the bungee on there long enough, uh, they would attach them uh, themselves. We can then remove it and then uh, the rest is up to them. Uh, and then you can see once we plot it out, uh, the sponge life and try to keep it as diverse as possible. So we just didn't have orange walls and yellow walls and pink walls. Uh, we literally uh, try to keep that biodiversity uh, mimicked as best as we can uh, as we collected them. Um, so the stats, there were 25 panel sections in total that were getting uh, uh, replaced. Um, we kept six control sections, which uh, the Victoria National Parks Association partnered up with us to run some citizen science uh, along the side. So the whole objective of the project was to reduce the recovery time of that habitat. So we needed some control panels uh, where Mother Nature was doing it herself versus uh, the growth rate on the panels that we populated. Uh, as you can see, 22 panels per section. 16 sections, etc. Uh, so the objective was to then try and glue over 2,000 sponges uh, one at a time uh, in winter. Yes. Um, so how did we go? It took us eight months, every weekend for eight months, uh, but we got there. Um, 700 after the 12 months, 796 uh, were full adults were thriving. Um, the survival rate there of what we transferred, uh, you can see is 37.6%. Uh, we put it down our largest issue for, um, um, I guess, any kind of not survival uh, was the fact that we couldn't isolate the area and, and bunt it off and stop other divers and snorkelers from interacting with the area. So we would uh, unfortunately lose a lot of um, 
a lot of the sponges because people had kicked them off or fumbled with the project or whatever. We just couldn't section it off. Uh, we had a little bit of necrosis. So if the bungees were too tight, it would compress the sponge a little bit too much and reduce obviously the, the water flow through it and then uh, basically choke it uh, and it would die. So the necrosis side of things was about 6%, I believe from memory. Um, uh, there's a little bit of example, 82% sponges, 18% uh, ascidians. Um, and uh, yeah, you should see it now, it's amazing. Uh, above and below. So there were horizontal, I guess, beams in the water. We populated above and let mother nature do it below. So after 12 months, uh, there's an example of, uh, of, I guess, how we can intervene and create uh, yeah, some, uh, some impact there. Uh, will we do it again? Absolutely, but you can't do it on your own. There's an example of how many people were involved uh, and, uh, and the amount of volunteers required to do something on this scale. So uh, anyway, I hope you got something out of it. And if you have any questions, hit us up and I'll be more than happy to give some more details after this. Thank you so much, AJ. That was amazing. Um, and yeah, really, really exciting stuff going on there. Uh, we'll jump to questions just after our final speaker, who is Melanie Bishop from the Living Seawall Project. I'll just give a quick introduction, Melanie, then we'll jump into your talk. So Melanie has over 15 years of experience as a marine ecologist and leads a globally respected team of 15 researchers from seven countries in the Department of Biological Sciences. Um, Melanie is a past recipient of the New South Wales Scientist of the Year Award and is a Young Tall Poppy Science Award winner. Melanie's team's research addresses how ecosystems operate and respond to change. Uh, sorry, uh, her research has investigated a diverse range of environmental problems, including shellfish disease, coastal erosion, nutrient enrichment, invasive species and marine urban sprawl. Her present research has a particular focus on the development and evaluation of engineering interventions that create habitats and conserve native biodiversity in degraded seascapes. Melanie co-leads the Green Engineering Working Group of the World Harbour Project and the Living Seawalls Program currently working closely with the New South Wales oyster industry to assess how the industry's selective breeding programs may be harnessed for purposes of rehabilitating Australia's lost shellfish reef, of which less than 1% remain. Thanks so much for joining us today, Melanie. Um, take it away. Hi, thanks for having me. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Um, I'm on a combination of my phone and my desktop that doesn't have sound. Uh, I've been having major di technical difficulties. So apologies um, if this is repetitive of some of the previous presentations I have only just managed to join. Uh, so I will load up the PowerPoint um, on my other connection. Can you all see that? Uh, yes, that's clear. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm representing Living Seawalls and Living Seawalls is all about reviving um, life along our built coastlines. Uh, so the problem I imagine has probably already been addressed in the previous presentations. Um, but it's the growing um, construction that we're seeing in our coastal environment, ranging from everything from uh, breakwaters uh, to offshore islands, uh, to offshore wind, which is now on the agenda for Australia, uh, to ports and of course, jetties and recreational infrastructure. And these are vital human functions, um, but they also um, have major modifications to the marine environment. So they displace natural habitats, but they also introduce new habitat as well. And the problem with the new habitat is that it is not equivalent to the closest natural analogues um, to, to these structures. And so this is an example here of one of the structures that we've typically worked with, uh, which is a seawall. And it, you can see it has a very flat and featureless surface uh, that provides nowhere for marine life to hide from both the forces of nature and from predators. Uh, by contrast, we've got a natural uh, rocky shore here where you can see that there's all kinds of nooks and crannies for species to live in. So our team um, has addressed this uh, issue uh, through a multidisciplinary approach. And so we can 
combine industrial design expertise uh, with ecological expertise from the Sydney Institute of Marine, Marine Sciences. And uh, the concept with which we're working is really simple, um, and that is um, reintroducing uh, missing habitats to these built structures. Uh, and so uh, typically what we have been using is habitat panels uh, that are modular and it can be scaled up or down according to the size of a structure. And the concept is really simple. Uh, these panels both reintroduce um, these hidey holes that are missing um, from built structures. And they also increase the surface area for organisms to attach to. And what we've seen is that in as little as two years, we're seeing over three times as many species on these habitat panels as flat surfaces of similar age. The designs of our living seawalls panels are inspired by nature uh, and range from um, the natural weathering that we see in sandstone along the New South Wales coast through to uh, the holdfast structure of um, kelp um, through to sponge fingers. Uh, we started in Sydney Harbour in late 2018 um, and largely thanks to our success as a finalist in Prince William's Earthshot Prize last year, um, we have um, subsequently expanded to over 20 sites, um, not only along the east coast of Australia, but also around the world. Uh, one of the key um, features of our program is it is very much driven and informed by science. And so, um, as you saw from one of the earlier slides, three quarters of our core team um, trained marine ecologists working as university academics. And so um, a big part of our program is um, assessing the efficacy of our approaches and identifying how we may be better able to target these to specific, specific environmental goals and to specific environmental settings. Uh, so this environmental monitoring program ranges from everything to microbes um, that are the initial colonizers of marine surfaces uh, through to invertebrates and seaweeds um, that um, over time accumulate um, and provide food and habitat to species such as fish, uh, through to ecological functions that are often um, key objectives of stakeholders, um, such as improvement of water quality by encouraging the growth and biomass of filter feeding species, such as bivalves and oysters, um, through to enhancing uh, recreational fishing opportunities um, and fisheries productivity. And so our monitoring and evaluation programs are typically done at two scales. Uh, so the first is the site scale. And um, I guess initially that might involve um, assessing what is present on um, our structure prior to intervention and how that compares to adjacent natural habitat analogues. Um, and so the questions we're asking here is what is missing on the built structure that we might be seeing uh, in natural habitats in a similar kind of environmental setting? And therefore, what kinds of features do we need to be reintroducing to these structures um, to target um, key missing organisms? Um, then post um, installation of our eco-engineered interventions, the types of questions we will ask are how well are the eco-engineered interventions performing um, in terms of enhancing biodiversity over what we might see on an unmodified structure and approaching that what as uh, that which we might see on a natural habitat type. Um, and so this is the example of a type of data that we might get um, at, at time points thereafter. And so this is um, from a master's student thesis and she was looking at fish observations on living seawalls um, versus rocky shores, um, whose habitat features we were seeking to recreate and control seawalls uh, that were unmodified. And really excitingly here after 24 months, we're seeing much higher um, numbers of fish utilizing the living seawalls that have received the eco-engineering intervention um, than the unmodified control seawalls and actually fish numbers that are very comparable to natural rocky shores. Um, in addition to monitoring of the performance of um, these living seawalls in interventions at site scales, we're also really interested in how um, different types of complexity and habitat texture we provide uh, perform. And so we also typically do panel scale monitoring as assessment as well. And so the questions we're asking here are, do complex panels where we've added these little hidey holes for species, how do they 
compare compared to flat featureless control. So we indeed seeing um, the um, enhancement of biodiversity that we predict. And second of all, do different designs support different species? And so one of the ideas behind living seawalls is that we're actually creating mosaics of different types of habitats. Um, and so what we're hoping is that um, different panels will support different communities of species, and we might be able to mix and match the types of panels that we provide um, according to environmental goals and environmental settings. And so again, sort of giving you an illustration of um, the types of results we've been seeing. This is from one of our seawall sites in Sydney Harbour that was established in late 2018. And so what we have here is the total number of species that we're observing on flat panels, um, control panels, versus um, panels with textures such as crevices, honeycombs, rock pool, and swim through. And so the really encouraging thing here is that we're seeing in all instances, um, our habitat panels are supporting more biodiversity, uh, but how much really depends on the design. And so here you can see these panels um, that are designed to retain water at low tide in the intertidal zone are really our star performers. But um, I guess uh, number of species is just one thing. Um, I guess the types of species that are present is another. And so um, what we are seeing is that there are actually really distinct ecological communities that are found on each of these panel types. Um, and so what we are seeing here is that um, each of these colours represents a different functional group of organism. Don't worry too much about what they are. Um, but we're seeing species turn up on the rock pool panels that wouldn't be there otherwise. Also in the crevice and honeycomb, we're seeing lots of different species of algae colonising um, that are not present um, on flat featureless surfaces. Um, and through time, uh, the uh, composition of the panels changes. Our program um, is all about um, education and advocacy as well. And so a strong uh, component has been outreach and education. Uh, and so with our installations, uh, we've worked closely with local government um, and stakeholders to develop public signage to explain, um, I guess, the types of um, marine life that these structures uh, provide habitat to and how we can actually enhance it. Um, by providing these three-dimensional habitats. Um, we have also been quite active at Science Week events with um, uh, activities aimed at getting uh, high school and primary school kids to start thinking about how we can better design um, marine built infrastructure um, and the Volvo Ocean Lovers Festival. Um, so where are we at and where to next? Um, so I guess seawalls, which is really where we've started, is obviously just one type of built structure. Um, and so we have piling wraps that are in the final stages of development um, and uh, that really are what we are hoping uh, will be implemented at the wharf. Um, and uh, so this is really taking the same modular concept um, that we've developed for seawalls, um, but wrapping them around pilings instead. Uh, and then also creating more three-dimensional uh, forms of these panels um, that are blocks and can be embedded in structures since, such as revetments. So at Living Seawalls, our goal is really um, that all new marine construction uh, will be designed for both humans and nature. Um, and so uh, this is just really a brief overview of um, some of our work to date, and I'd be happy to take any questions if we have time later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melanie. We're so glad that you could join us today. And yeah, that's been really fascinating. So our speakers today have been Sophie Teed, Nathan Cook, AJ Morton and Melanie Bishop. We've covered the topics from ranging from, you know, the rehabilitation of uh, old ecosystems that have been changed. And then Melanie's topic just there was the development of new infrastructure underwater and making it better suited to the marine environment. I'll hand over to Doug now to facilitate some questions if anyone's got some. Thank you, Minka. Outstanding job. And look, uh, thank you all the speakers. And look, um, Libby Hepburn. Libby, would you like to unmute and ask your question, please? Thanks, everybody. Uh, those were brilliant presentations. It's wonderful to see what's happening. Um, like you, we were faced with an issue and, and we got together as a community and it's been a really interesting process so far. I'm very interested in what we can do in the long term to monitor what's there. Have any of you got any particular ideas about how 
uh, community groups can monitor what, what what's happening, not just in the immediate recovery time, but over long periods? Absolutely. I mean, there's a real key role for citizen scientists here. Um, I think, you know, there have been some really great examples in the coastal space how this can be done effectively. So I don't know um, if you're familiar with the CoastNap project, um, where members of the public are taking pictures um, of Beach State. Um, so we've just actually started conversations with Microsoft, hoping to sort of use a similar kind of approach, I guess, um, particularly with some of our inter intertidal installations where um, the public can actually take photos of um, some of our living seawalls panels and um, using the spectra and the colours of growth on those panels, we can help to identify what is actually present. Uh, so that is one idea. And I think, you know, one of the other really great examples that some of you might be familiar with is um, Reef Life Survey and actually using um, recreational divers and um, snorkelers potentially to um, collect data on uh, some of the fish life that is using these habitats. The, there's so many citizen science programs that are mm. operational in different parts of the country. So I guess to also Libby, it's just a matter of finding, you know, what habitat you're interested in, whether it's the seawalls or subtitle or whatever, and looking at what addresses that. So, and, and there's lots of different reef life surveys, quite detailed and complicated sometimes, depending on the level you want to go to. So it really depends on what your aims are, but you know, there's things like bird life that looks at birds, so you don't even have to get in the water. So it really depends on what your aims and objectives mm -hmm. are. But as Melanie said, so many different citizen science programs, it's just about doing a little bit of research for your local area. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we've got a question from Shamaran. Yep. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks for all those presentations. It's been really helpful. Um, I'm actually working for the Batemans Marine Park, and we've got a very similar project underway here at the moment, or it's about to kick off with um, the replacement of the Naruma Town Wharf. So I'm really curious to see what's happened in other sites and what's been effective particularly your work, Sophie. So um, I just wanted to ask some questions of Sophie, if that's all good. <laughs> hey, Hello. how are you going? <laughs> um, yeah, so j while, you were, while you were presenting, you mentioned that you weren't using Denso wraps anymore. Was there any particular <laughs> reason for that? Or like, how did you de decide what was the best material to use? Um, yeah, so that was a decision um, that was made um, at the local government level. So we okay. weren't really party to that decision. So um, I would imagine that it was um, like economic reasons or yep. supply supply reasons. Um, yeah, yeah, no worries. We're all, more than some sort of, yeah, other kind of reason yep. related to what you were doing. Yeah. And... Um, in addition to the like the plastic garden mesh that you used, mm. did you um, trial anything else and find that that was your best option? Because, yeah, like AJ was saying, we wanted to try and steer away from plastic mm. based materials down here. But, yeah, if, it, if it's unavoidable, we're just going to have to deal with that. Yeah, so the um, I tried... Um, uh, steel steel mesh as well, um, but a bit similar to um, Nathan's project um, on the Wonder Reef. That over time, just the action of the sea um, really stretched that mesh, and it wasn't yep. it didn't provide a, a good enough um, a firm enough barrier to hold those um, colonies against the substrate. Um, I also tried um, attaching individual colonies. Um, but I think, and as AJ mentioned, um, I was doing this in the winter time as well, and it's the best time for the sponges to grow. Um, it's the worst time for diving, and it's the worst time to have something gentle that you just want to slowly grow there. Um, so, yeah, having individual attachments didn't really work either. Um, so, yeah, it definitely was um, a bit of a compromise, and yeah, just the realisation that 
in our situation that the that guard plastic lattice did work the best and it was um, growing over the top of plastic so you know that natural substrate of the timber pile was no longer there it, it yeah. is growing on a plastic substrate so yeah I felt um, given that in the in the end we were able to be quite successful with that recolonization that yeah all of the plastic um, is encased in the piles um, in behind the growth. Yeah. Um, there's not to say that it's not breaking down over time or that perhaps the sponges aren't incorporating that into their bodies. Um, there's probably a lot of questions around that, but it does, it does preserve the diversity. Mm. Yeah, okay. And um, you also mentioned that some of the piles that were replaced were steel. So what treatments did they get? Was, were they treated in the same way? No, the steel piles um, uh, simply have a paint coating on. Yep. And, um, yeah, if your, your council is selecting timber or steel piles, um, we have found here that there's little difference between steel and timber colonisation um, okay. over, over a long period of time. Yep. Um, but that is kind of premising that you, you do have some of those um, old pile stubs remaining. Yep. Um, so you do need, yeah, you do need to maintain um, some of those in close proximity to the new piles. But steel is just as good, and steel also lasts for longer. And you'll have you won't hopefully you wouldn't be going down this process of trying to help sponges and save a structure at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, no, under our scenario, um, the piles that are going to be replaced are all going to be steel piles. Like that's been decided by mm -hmm. um, transport, the agency that's yeah. doing the job. So, yeah, there are some constraints that we have to work within, but it's just been really interesting to find out how you've transplanted mm -hmm. as much of the growth as possible from, you know, your existing structure onto your new structures. Thanks, Emma, and they were uh, fantastic questions. Uh, look, there's no one else um, with their hand up, um, is, unless someone whips up their hand in a minute. Well, no, here we go. We've got a hand up and I'm trying to see who it is. Luke Hamilton, <laughs> you go for it, Luke. Thanks, guys. Uh, thanks so much for your presentation, so terrific. Um, Sophie, you answered my question about when's the best time for um, working with sponges uh, but is there is there a good time for is that the same time for all the other organisms that we're looking to sort of transplant yeah so I definitely found um, a, a much greater success in tr well trans doing the transplanting in the late autumn so that they potentially had two or three weeks to settle down before the main winter storms really hit. They can, you know, they, those fronts and the rain events can be quite full on, um, as opposed to doing it, you know, in something like November or December. Um, there, and I think that came down to reduced food availability. Um, that, yeah, these filter feeding animals are, um, getting their food from detritus and um, other propagules in the water. So yeah, even though it's, um, it's not fun for diving, it was worked out to be the best time of year. And yeah, it was reassuring that, yeah, um, AJ had a similar experience down there in Melbourne. Um, and yeah, I've also, I'm aware of another project that was looking at coral growth um, in temperate ecosystems and, and they found the largest coral growth um, during the winter time as well for temperate corals. So that seems to be the, the knowledge that we have. I can add to that a little bit more uh, mm. if you'd like. I've, I'm not too sure what it's like in WA in New South Wales, but over the summer periods, we get a lot of algae growth um, and a lot of it floating in the water columns, which tends to choke I guess, for lack of a bit of a word, uh, some of the growth uh, on our dive site. So uh, that's another contributing factor, a lot more algae and things like that floating around in the summer months. Okay, thanks, AJ. And Nathan, you've got a question there. Well, my question was whether I can contact AJ and ask him about his supplier for glue. <laughs> Sweet, I will do that because I've tried lots of different adhesives for different methods and... Um, the super glue works really well, but uh, yeah, it's pretty expensive unless you can get a bulk supplier. Well, 
what a fantastic um, set of information and, and wonderful contacts being made um, there. Minka, you've got your hand up. Uh, hey, yeah. Just a quick question about the glue for AJ. Did you find that the sponges and stuff actually attached to the wooden planks? Was I think it was wood on those walls, was it? Yeah, did they attach to that or were they just mainly held on by that glue permanently? Yeah, good question. So we can't just rely on the glue there being forever holding up our habitat. <laughs> so we had to be careful. Uh, well, first off, we knew that the sponges will attach to the timber. So we had to be careful about how much glue you put under there um, so that it still had contact with the timber. So we wanted to try and promote that adhesion. Um, so some of the sponges and whatnot, they all still have to have that contact with the timber. So you've got to kind of measure how big is the sponge versus under surface area and how much contact do you really need for it to hold there. Uh, and then we had those uh, bungees sitting over there for a couple of weeks just to provide that uh, that opportunity for, for that adhesion. And you can kind of map it out. It's about seven days we noticed you could start to see the growth. By about 10 days, it's actually starting to stick. And by about two weeks, uh, it was enough to take the, uh, the bungee cords off and they were holding themselves up, provided someone didn't kick them off. <laughs> Yeah, okay, amazing. Thank you. I just had one more as well for Melanie. Um, I was just wondering what material your seawall structures are made out of, especially the wraps for the pylons. Yeah, so um, the wraps are still under development, but um, I guess the um, panels are made of um, eco blend cement. And so the idea with the concrete is that, you know, you can really um, pour it to, to any any kind of, I mean, it's you, you can mould it to, to any form and shape that you would like. Um, it includes uh, fly ash and blast furnace slag to um, reduce carbon emissions. And um, certainly there's lots of innovation going on in the um, concrete space. So we're hoping in the future to be able to use carbon neutral or even carbon negative materials for them. Yeah, cool. I was wondering, have you tried any like, I don't know if it would leach into the water or anything, but like recycled plastic kind of things or are we fully avoiding? Yeah, so I guess um, a recycled plastic fibres is um, a key reinforcing agent um, that is used in marine construction. So um, some of our panels have used that. Um, it's a tricky one. Um, you do tend to get a lot of backlash about plastics in the marine environment. Um, you know, they are generally well embedded in these materials. And um, I guess, you know, they're used broadly in marine construction anyway. So it's not uh, really introducing something that's not already there. But yes, it is It is a double-edged sword, I think. Um, so yeah, that one is certainly um, something that I think needs a little bit more investigation. Um, I'm really sorry, I'm gonna have to disappear and collect my daughter from childcare before it closes. But um, before any more you go, questions? Before you go, Melanie, you just deserve a gold starfish award for your perseverance there, because it's <laughs> such a stressful thing, not being able to get into Zoom room. It's happened to me once or twice. So I'm not sure what happened there, but you did very, very well. So thank you. Well, my apologies that I missed the other presentations. There'll be a recording. I'll send you the link. So okay, fantastic. And so I've got to disappear now. But um, yeah, lovely to meet you all. Thank you. And Luke, you might give us the final question and we'll wrap it up. Great. Thank you. Um, so my final question um, to anyone who wants to take it was about fish communities and fish numbers. I know Melanie had some figures there on, on fish numbers. You don't have to answer Melanie, that's fine. Um, but um, yeah, I was just wondering, once you go down this path of removing pylons and um, introducing blank surfaces, how, how long, of, or what, what's the immediate effect on, on the resident fish population? And then how long are we looking at before we see an increase in fish populations in those areas? And maybe Sophie, you had. And yeah, Nathan, I'm happy to yeah. jump in. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, there's a couple of factors there. Um, when the initial pile scraping happened here at Bustleton Jetty, there was an immediate um, movement away from the structure of the fish life. And that, that was immediate um, as soon as the um, all of the scraping had taken place. Um, <clears throat> it, but on the flip side, um, as soon as there were about four piles that had been rehabilitated with those tiny fragments on, um, there was fish back there just, you know, next to those little sponge colonies. So 
um, what, you know, that's, um, we think that was a, a, both a chemical um, and a visual cue for the fish that, you know, this is where I, I need to be, this is my habitat. Um, so they did move back in almost immediately. Um, but the other comment that I would like to make um, is probably around the construction and the, um, the impact of sand. Um, so we've had various constructions um, over the last eight, nine years here, um, a very big one um, in 2008, 2009. Um, some species of fish, um, like your, we have a yellow tail scad or a mackerel, it's like a slimy mackerel, big schooling fish. Um, they didn't really come back until about two years post-construction. And we suspect that they were heavily um, affected by the, the sound of piling and the um, underwater construction. So that's something to consider. Um, more recently, um, we've been looking at the impacts of underwater sound and specifically for piling. And we have, um, I've done some calculations that really looked at what the distance, like um, the distance that fish could be affected by. Um, and with the underwater construction of piling, um, you'd be looking to, you know, possible death of fishes um, that are within 100 metres of your um, piling construction. So if they're, if they're not going to swim away um, and some of your, your smaller reef fish probably won't swim away, whereas your um, kind of pelagic schooling fish will move, um, there'll be there will be some death with those residential fish. Um, if they don't swim away. But yeah, you're looking yeah, about 100 metres. And I know your, your little wharf's not very long, so. No, uh, the other question, well, I guess that leads to the question of that will that sound also affect um, seahorse? We're looking at the seahorse relocation site is within 100 metres of the, or well, oh. likely to be within 100 metres of the wharf, mm -hmm. um, I, I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely I would bring that up. Um, it, mm. Great, thank you. Yeah, that's note down, note that Cheers. one down. Yeah, yeah. terrific, thanks. <laughs> and on that cheery note, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up. But look, um, I just think everyone um, participating, you've just lifted the knowledge base um, that we've been working from. And, and, you know, going back to Minka and Luke and, and setting up this process and how in a couple of years, you know, we've got to this point, it's just a really a tribute to your work and Luke in particular pulling together all the speakers for tonight and uh, done an, an outstanding job. And I think the video will be of interest for a lot of people. Uh, we had a pretty good roll up, I think over 30 people in the room, but um, what we'll find is if we post that, I'm sure there's a lot of communities around Australia and perhaps elsewhere that will look at this and find it an in incredibly useful source of information. Before we go and before people pull the plug or before I pull the plug, um, just to say a reminder that it is the Sapphire Coast Science Festival and National Science Week and there are some fabulous activities. If you go to the Atlas of Life in uh, on the Sapphire Coast in <laughs> Libby, you better interrupt. The Atlas of Life webpage, there's a National Science Week page and just looking at it, um, there's the Tawny Frogmouth show. That may well be sold out. There are only 25 people. I think it is, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, on Thursday night, we have uh, Science in the Pub and there's a bit of light entertainment because the theme is lighthouses. And uh, we've got Heath Cullen playing music. We've got Greg Hansen, a, an engineer with AMPSA, the Australian Maritime Safety Authority. And he's, um, you know, put together a really interesting presentation on, on how they power, how they look after um, all those lighthouse things. So six o'clock at the Tafra Hotel tomorrow night. There is a $10 cover charge, but there is finger food, as I said, music. There's a quiz. Um, so it's going to be a fantastic night. On Friday, Libby, what's on Friday? We've got the... Uh, five o'clock, we've got the Australian Bioblitz Symposium. So we've gathered people um, who are running Bioblitzes currently um, to talk about what they're doing. And we're going to be discussing how we can enhance the value scientifically and for the community. So that's on, on Friday evening, seven, uh, five till 7.30. 
seven thirty till nine. At oh, sorry, sorry, right? Yes, seven thirty till nine, and then on Saturday night we've got a dinner at Pottery Palace followed by a possum hunt out in the trees to see all the nocturnal animals. So that's a really good one to go to. Go, go to. So if you go to the Atlas of Life um, webpage, mm. um, there's a, a link there on the front for National Science Week. And look, a, a big thank you to everyone for being here tonight out there in uh, the audience. We really appreciate your um, support. And uh, if you spread the word about Science Week, um, that'd be fantastic. You'll be sent a link with an evaluation. Everyone loves evaluation surveys. And it's, uh, it, look, it does support um, the, uh, the science community that is, uh, we've got some of this event isn't funded by um, Inspiring Australia New South Wales, but some of those other events are the science in the pub. So the data that you provide goes towards um, their um, message to the Commonwealth and state governments to give them more money for science engagement. So on that note, um, I've got a red button here that says end, and it always feels a little bit abrupt, but thank you all for being here and enjoy the rest of Science Week.